Good morning. Good morning. Let's stand and sing number 391 in the worship and song at Calvary. remain standing let's read the Apostles Creed number 881 I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified dead and buried the third day he rose from the dead he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. This morning I was listening to the message on XM radio as I was getting ready and 
the announcer guy announced this song talking about the cracks in our uh, walls or whatever, that that's how it lets light seep in. And this song was, he said, and this next song we're hearing is called Gracefully Broken, where we are gracefully broken and God's light can seep in to those broken places in our lives. So that's a thought for you for today. So for announcements this morning, uh, this Wednesday night, we will begin our Bible study back. We'll have it upstairs. There won't be any food, and that will begin at 6 p.m. Larry and Sandy will be doing the live broadcast at 5.30 p.m. We have several birthdays this week. Hunter and Jonathan Ford had their birthdays yesterday. And Carla, Carla Field's birthday is tomorrow. Andrew Field's birthday is Wednesday. So, and we mentioned you last week, Billy Joe, because we know you had a birthday last week. So let's sing happy, happy birthday to all these wonderful people. Anybody else? Anybody else have a birthday this week or coming up? blessing on each one of those having birthdays. For prayer requests this morning, we want to remember those affected by fires out west, those in the path of the Hurricane Sally. Continue to remember Aaron Penix. He's having some continued complications with his COVID and he went to the ER yesterday, but he is home recuperating. Continue to remember Cooper Coleman. He's going through his radiation right now. Larry Ellswick, healing from surgery. Let's remember Hazel McKinney and her family. She buried her sister Patricia Lowe yesterday. Georgia Anderson is in the hospital. Uh, she's a faithful member of the Pikeville Methodist Church and I've known her about all my life. She's having some complications from a foot surgery. Uh, I'm scheduled for an injection in my wrist Wednesday. I'd like to have your prayers. Anyone else need prayers this morning or have a prayer request? Let's continue to remember Paul's older brother, Rob Bevins. Anyone else? If not, we'll ask our pastor to come lead us in prayer. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, as we come before you, we want to thank you for allowing us to be here. And we, God, we want to remember those that have been mentioned here today and those unspoken requests that are on our hearts. God, we, we thank you, Lord, that in the midst of all the craziness in the world, that we can come to you. And you're a rock, Lord, that's solid, that doesn't change. And in a world, Lord, that seems to be out of control, we find, Lord, a place in you that's a sure foundation. God, I just want to lift up these prayer requests to you today, our families. God, we need you to answer our prayers and we continue to pray for this pandemic and those that have been affected by it and pray, Father, for both a cure and a vaccine. And God, we ask you today to help us that we might be a church that would shine our lights. And God, we pray as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespass, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
And so, uh, before we sing our doxology, uh, we continue to uh, thank you for uh, the giving. Uh, for those of you that continue to be faithful in that, offering plates set up there, which is something new to us, and uh, maybe other churches are doing it too. Uh, I remember one time I was leading a contemporary worship service in a Methodist church, and uh, it was going well. But uh, we wanted to do things a little different, so we talked about uh, rather than passing a plate like the traditional way is that we just uh, put something in the back and let people put in. And uh, some, of the, uh, some of the people uh, didn't like that idea. They said it, it wouldn't work. Uh, but uh, it can work, and I thank you for that. I thank you for your giving because uh, you're not giving it to to a person, you're giving it to God, and these are God's God's offerings. So thank you for that. So uh, let's uh, stand and sing our doxology, and then I'll ask uh, Richie if he would pray as soon as we finish. Let's do. Would you pray? Amen. You may be seated. All right, just two of you guys, so you gotta be real well for everyone. I saw you raise your hand that it's almost your birthday. When's your birthday? How old are you gonna be? Eleven. Oh eleven. That's also out of my first anniversary. So there you go. We'll have all kinds of celebrations. There we go. We love September twenty first. <laughs> What do you do when, like, to make a phone call, what do you have to do? <laughs> so you basically just see a picture and click a button, and then you get to talk to them, right? Yeah. Pretty easy. So it's not always been that easy to make a phone call, and others may know better than me. Uh, did you guys know there used to be a thing called a party line? <laughs> So there's been a whole, a whole progression of being able to make phone calls from the old turn dial to go all the way through. Then uh, at one point, um, there used to be your, basically your whole community would be on one phone line versus just picking up and calling. So you could answer and there could be five people already talking and you would just have to ask to find the person that you're looking for. That's pretty wild. You used to have to wait until after it was a certain time to be able to call because you would get charged a lot until it was after 9 o'clock, 8 o'clock. I don't even remember now. I just remember waiting by the phone. Like, it's almost time before my mom wouldn't get mad at me anymore. <laughs> so now you can just click a button. There's almost too many ways to get a hold of people. You can send a message. You can send a Facebook message. You can send an Instagram message. You can send a phone call. There's almost too many ways that people can get a hold of us now. And it was almost similar at one point to being able to talk to God. You guys ever talk to God? Yeah. What do you guys do to be able to do that? Yeah, you just pray. We can sit here right here and be able to talk to God. But we read in the Bible that kind of how there used to be a big, long process to make a phone call, 
It used to be the same with how they would teach people that's how you could talk to God. You used to have to go to a temple, and a lot of times people would have to bring a sacrifice, or they would have to go out and buy something, and then a priest would have to be available. So you have to go through all these steps. Imagine every time you wanted to talk to God, you had to call Larry and bring a piece of gold and come to the church. <laughs> that would be difficult, right? But that's something that Jesus also did. So when he died on the cross, right, he did a few different things. One, that was the way for us to, um, to forgive us of our sin, but it was also a way for all people to have the chance to know God. And so when he died and when Jesus came to teach us all these lessons, the point was so that we could all know God and know that we had a direct line to God, kind of like we do now with the 50 different ways that we can talk to each other. That's one of the ways that it made it easier, that we can just sit wherever we are and at any moment be able to talk to God and know that we have a direct conversation. So sometimes the simpler way is the best way. Cool? All right, guys. So remember, you always have a chance to do that. Anytime something's get a little wonky or also there's just a big celebration, like your birthday coming up, it's a great chance to thank God. God, if you guys like to pray for us for the week before we start, let's see. Okay. Beauty, 
I see For it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died reading is from 1 Corinthians, beginning with verse 18. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we know there are many stumbling blocks to our relationship with you. Our boastfulness, our pride, our vanity, and even our wisdom. We pray that those impediments might be removed. Bless our pastor now as he opens the word to us on these issues. For it's in Christ's name we pray. 
Is that what I mean? Good. Thank you, Ron. We are living in the golden age of protests. Everywhere you turn, uh, there is, seem like, someone uh, protesting. And uh, case in point, between uh, January of 2017 to March of 2018, there was some 10 to 15 million protesters. Also, around that time, uh, there were protesters in all 50 states, even places where normally they don't protest, they were protesting. And uh, we think about some of the recent ones, uh, the ones that are close to home. Uh, I know that we had, uh, even in Kentucky, uh, Louisville and Lexington especially, uh, have had some problems. Uh, thankfully, we haven't had any here in our area. Um, but in, the, in Louisville, I know that they had some issues over the Breonna Taylor thing. And, and here's the thing, you know, uh, what happens sometimes, I think that people are quick to, uh, to get excited before they know the facts. And, and sometimes it takes a while to even find all that out. And, uh, and so uh, I think the media has a way of, of distorting things. So we have to be careful that we're not following along with, with a narrative that may not be 100%. Um, and you know, when it comes to our, uh, our police officers and stuff, I think we have a right, a privilege and a right to support our officers and to pray for them. And I don't know about other places. I, I'm not, I can't speak to the, you know, maybe there needs to be changes in some other places, but I can speak for those that I am know and the people that in this community and they put their lives on the line every day, every time they put their uniforms on and the people that I know are here to serve and protect. And, uh, and I think they deserve our respect. So I don't see that our, air, our immediate area is, is a problem. I don't know about other places. I can't speak to that. I'm, I'm not uh, privy to that. But I do know this. Um, not everybody who uh, is protesting is wanting to cause trouble. I was uh, talking to a chaplain the other day who is chaplain in Louisville for the special operations unit. And they got all this going on that's been going on for a while with the Breonna Taylor and all that. And more is going to come out of that. And the jury's still out. And by the way, uh, when, when the grand jury decides what they're going to do, there'll probably be more riots, uh, whatever happens, as we understand. But this particular chaplain was sitting on a bench in the park that has now been ded dedicated to uh, Breonna Taylor. And he, as he's sitting there one day, the family shows up for Breonna Taylor, her family. And they come up and speak to him, and he says, I'm very sorry, I, uh, I, I don't want to take your spot, and, and you know all that. And she says, oh, no, it's fine. You, you should take as long as you want. And, uh, and she said, you know, she said something like this. She said, we're all going to have to live together when this is all over with. And it lets you know that, that not everybody is uh, wanting to have uh, riots and those things, but we want peace and we want those things. So when we think about all of these things, what do these protests really do? Do they have an impact? Well, time will tell. What we do know is that a number of protest movements uh, have actually changed history. Think about Martin Luther's 95 Thesis. When, he, when Martin Luther put his 95 Thesis on the Wittenberg Chapel, that was a protest, which started the protest or the Protestant Reformation. The protest against the Stamp Act of 1765 led to the United States of America being formed. Think about Rosa Parks' refusal to move to the back of a segregated bus in 1965 Alabama, which ignited the Civil Rights Movement. 
and even the Beatles had a social impact on our world because they refused to play to a segregated audience. John Lennon said, we have never have and we never will. And they refused and they allowed everyone, no matter what color, to come to their concerts. And the song, one of my favorite songs, Blackbird, is even a song that is about racial inequality. So marches and rallies and all these have their place and they certainly can have an impact and change the world if they're done in the right way. But I want to say to talk today about a, a protest that has changed the world profoundly and is continuing to change the world. And that is God's protest movement. You see the cross is a protest against wisdom and against signs and wonders and all that. It's a protest against those things. Uh, because Paul said there are those who demand signs and wisdom before they will accept God or believe in God. But he says in verse 18 that the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But unto us are being saved. It's the power of God. You see, the, Paul, the Apostle Paul says that the cross is really a protest against all of the, the world's philosophies and the world's understanding and all the signs and wonders. And Paul believed that we should live what, what we can call today as a cross-shaped life. So Paul is uh, contending some of these signs and, and wisdom and all this. And why is he so upset about all of this? Why even bring it up? Why protest against signs and wisdom? Well, Paul discovered, uh, as he said in verse 21, that the world did not know God through wisdom. That it wasn't through wisdom that the world came to know God. They didn't come to know God through wisdom. Signs and wisdom are not enough. You can have all the wisdom and you would think that that would be it. That if you could just uh, sit down and convince someone and use philosophy or use uh, even the ontological arguments or uh, the theological arguments. And all these arguments are great, but they and in them themselves are not enough to convince someone about God and about their need for Christ, really. Someone said, said it like this, if, if you believe, you don't need an explanation. And if you don't believe, no explanations are enough. There's nothing can be said to convince you. So Paul realizes that something more than signs and wonders are needed to change the world. And he realized that very thing is the cross. So simple, isn't it? You see, the surprising and shameful death of Jesus on the cross is what the world needs. Because it is the cross that speaks about love and forgiveness more than anything else. And you won't find that in most of your books other than the Bible. That's kind of a shock in a way. You know, Paul is hitting the streets and he's proclaiming Christ crucified, as verse 23 says, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. And some people even today say that's foolishness to talk about Jesus dying on the cross. And in the world today, many of them don't want to hear about anything about uh, a martyr or about anything about the blood of Jesus or the cross of Jesus but the cross is God's protest movement, really, and it changes the world forever. It really does. And I think we need to be a part of this movement today. And because many of us still demand a sign, people are still looking for signs. People are still wanting to find God through wisdom. Apostle Paul says, not many of you, as you look around among you, not many of you wise and noble not many of you rich and powerful. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. <clears throat> you see, you can not say that God chose me because I'm wise, because you can look and see a whole bunch of people that are not wise that God chose. And you can't say God chose me because I'm rich, because you can see a whole lot of people that are not rich 
that are saved. And you can't say God chose me because I'm influential because you can see a lot of people who have no nobility, but yet they're saved. And he says in verse 18, those who are being saved, it is the power of God. You see, there's a couple things this morning about the cross-shaped life. Number one is that a cross-shaped life reaches out to others. It's not about me. It's not about getting what I want. It's about reaching out to others. It's about seeing the needs of those around us and seeing the problems and being able to try to do something about it. Number two, a cross-shaped life, it's foolishness to the world, but it has the power to change hearts. It is the cross. It is the message. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, all, I will draw all unto me. It is the cross that brings people to God. It is not our intellectual uh, capacities. And, and, you know, I could stand up here today and, and try to remember some of my Greek and Hebrew and try to impress you with all these uh, big words and all that. But it's not going to change your heart. It is the cross of Jesus that changes hearts today. You know, the Apostle Paul knew that the people that he was talking to there in Corinth and the people in Greece were people who were great philosophers. They studied philosophy and they studied all these great thinkers and they valued philosophy and they valued all these things. And for them, it was, it was hard for them to accept that something so simple as the message of a man on the cross could be what they had to accept. And for the Jews, it was a stumbling block because that was not at all what they expected. So he says, we proclaim Christ crucified, that through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who would believe. And I really believe that the only thing that's going to change the world today is that we get back to the message of the cross. See, I don't know a whole lot about politics. I don't know a whole lot about economics. I don't know a whole lot about all those things that they're arguing about today. And you can figure that out when you go to the voting place. But I do know about this. I do know there was a man called Jesus who died on an old rugged cross for you and for me. He stretched between the heavens and the earth and he gave his life that we might have a way to eternal life. And I can tell you that for a fact that Jesus wants to come into your life and have a relationship with you. And that, my friend, will change the world if we get a hold of that. That's why he said that God has chosen uh, what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. He said so that no one can boast in the presence of of God, which means when I stand in the presence of God, I will not be able to say, I'm here because of my wisdom, or I'm here because of my greatness, greatness, or I'm here because of my good works. I will have to fall on his feet and say, I'm here only by the grace of God. You may be one of those who feel like you can get to heaven because you're good, or you may be just the opposite. You may be one of those who feel like I can't make it to heaven because I'm not good enough. Well, I've got news for both of you. The only way you're going to get to heaven is by the grace of God and through the cross of Christ. There's no other way. There's no other way. I was called to the hospital one night after hours to visit someone. And I went in the room and uh, this, this person, when I went in, it was obvious that it lived a rough life. And I said, what can I do for you? And they began to tell me a little bit about their story. And I found out that, you know, drugs and alcohol and these things had taken a toll on their life. And now they were dying with cancer. And this person was having a really hard time. And, you know, what I found out, the, uh, all the nurses and, and everybody were, were just about done. This person had been very, very hard to deal with. Very rude. And, you know, I imagine if, if I was in that much pain and stage four cancer, I'd probably be a little uh, hard to deal with, too. 
But he began to cry as I stood, sat there in that room. And he said, I've, I've lived a bad life. I've done some bad things. And I don't know if God will even forgive someone like me. And I said, I want you to know that it's somebody like you that why Jesus went to the cross. And somebody like me. That it's by the grace of God that we're here. And God does want to save you if you want him. And he said, I do. And I had the privilege of baptizing him right there in that room. He went home and a few days later he come back and he's in even worse shape than he was physically. But when I talked to some of the staff, they said, what happened to this man? They said, he is a different person. He was so rude and so mean and so hard to deal with. And now he's so different. He's friendly and, and he's sharing his story and, and being kind to everyone. They couldn't understand the difference, but I can. I can understand the difference because I know he came in contact. He met a man named Jesus. He went to the cross, and on that cross he found the Savior of the world. I'm saying today that the cross of Jesus is the only thing that's going to change the world. I don't know about all the other stuff. I don't know. I mean, I, I, maybe some things need to change in our policies and all that, but I don't know about that. I just know this. That I was a man that was on my way to a devil's hell and I was, I was torn all to pieces. I was living a life and I wasn't happy. And if I hadn't have found Jesus, I would have ended up uh, in jail or dead one. And Jesus got a hold of me and he changed my life and he turned my life around. And he can do the same for you. Sometimes we get away from the cross, don't we? Sometimes we, we, we get away and we, we realize that we need to come back to that place. We need to come back to the place where we see Jesus. You know, yeah, we live in the golden age of protest, but no modern rally, no protest can ever achieve what God accomplished on the cross of Jesus Christ. I think of that song when the writer penned those words. Lead me to Calvary, lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me. Lead me to Calvary. And I hope today that we can share that to the world, and I hope I can share that with you, that you've been to Calvary. If you haven't ex been there, if you haven't met a man named Jesus, if you haven't accepted him into your heart and life, he's waiting on you. I, I, I know some of the people I, I used to know, some of the old Baptist people, they made getting saved so hard. Like you got to clean your life up, or, or you got to beg God, or you got to, the old preacher used to say uh, they were traveling. Actually, uh, for, come from the word travailing. And I grew up, and some of my old kin folks said they would travel. For years before they get saved. And they go to the altar and they would mourn and cry for God to save them. And then they go out the door thinking they weren't saved. They come back the next Sunday and do the same thing or the next month whenever they had church. And I guess they think God is up there just wringing his hands thinking, you know, you're going to have to beg a little harder before I'm going to save you. But I want to tell you that's not the way God is. I don't care what you've done or where you've been or who you are or what color you are. The Lord Jesus is waiting for you. He's waiting. His arms are always ready. And the moment that you take that first step, he's going to meet you before you even get to the front. The night I gave my life to the Lord, little country church they were singing nothing but the blood of Jesus what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus and I kept waiting for something to happen some kind of feeling or, or some kind of thunderbolt or something and none of that ever happened so I just stood up and I started to the front of the church one night in a little revival. And I came to a new altar. I 
And I said, Lord, if you'll have me, I want to serve you. And I found out that night that his grace is sufficient. And I met a man named Jesus on the cross of Calvary. And I want to invite you today to come to know that same person. As the musicians come, we get ready for a song today. I want to tell you that today that the only thing that's going to make a difference in your heart to make you prepare for heaven is the cross. Is that you come to Jesus and allow Him to change your heart and to change your life. And everything else will fall into place. As we sing, I want to invite you to come and to pray today. Let's stand. Sing number 301, Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross. Let's do verses 1, 2, and 4. <clears throat> just for a moment. I want to tell you today that God doesn't want anybody, He doesn't want to lose anybody. It's not His will that any would perish. God doesn't want to lose one person. But He's not going to force anybody. And if you don't go to heaven, it's not because God didn't allow you to. It's because you made a choice and you basically walked away from God and said, and you walked around the cross. And you said, I, I, I don't want that. But today you don't have to do that. You can come to the cross. And it's just as easy as it's saying yes to Jesus. And so as we sing this last verse, if God is speaking to your heart today, I want to invite you to come down this to the front here, and I'd be glad to talk with you and spend some time with you after church. You may say, well, that's embarrassing. I don't want to go down in front of everybody, but let me tell you something. What's, what's worse than that is that you don't come down here and you leave today lost. And we don't have a promise of tomorrow. None of us do. I want to invite you to do that. Be, be a man or a woman and walk down the aisle Jesus is calling you publicly today. And I'd be glad to show you and tell you how you can know Christ today. 
as we sing one more verse. Please come. by the hospital or I'll meet you here. Uh, but if anybody needs uh, to talk about anything, pray about anything, feel free to call me. And that's any time. All right. And so uh, let's uh, join me in the benediction. Go out among the outcasts and the grieving and speak the word of life and hope. And may the God who breathed life into creation be your delight. We go in peace, love, and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Verse 1. Send forth by God's blessing, a true faith confessing, the people of God from this dwelling take leave. The service is ended. And now be extended the fruits of our worship in all who believe. The seed of the teaching, receptive souls reaching, shall blossom in action for God and for all. God's grace did invite us and love shall unite us to work for God's kingdom and that's come.